The following video presentation reviews avulsion fractures of the tibial tubercle. Here are our disclosures. In our discussion of the evaluation and management of tibial tubercle avulsion fractures, we will spend some time reviewing the epidemiology, the relevant anatomy, typical findings on physical examination and imaging, and the classification of these injuries. We will then discuss the indications for both operative and non-operative management approaches, post-surgical rehabilitation, and outcomes reported in the literature. The presentation will conclude with a case presentation. Tibial tubercle avulsion fractures are relatively rare injuries with a reported incidence of 0.4 to 2.7 percent of all physeal injuries. They most commonly present in athletic males aged 12 to 17 years. The theory behind tibial tubercle avulsion fractures is that increased athletic participation coupled with higher intensity training creates both intrinsic and extrinsic causes of fracture at the level of tibial tubercle physis. In a skeletally immature patient, two ossification centers exist within the proximal tibia. Supplied by the recurrent anterior tibial artery, the tibial tubercle physis can be exposed to significant eccentric loads applied by the extensor mechanism during strenuous activity. These eccentric loads, generated by quadriceps contraction during cutting, pivoting, and jumping sports, can overwhelm the tibial tubercle physis, leading to an avulsion type injury. When tibial tubercle avulsion fractures occur, they lead to the sudden onset of significant pain and an inability to bear weight on the affected side. A large hemarthrosis often develops quickly following injury. Upon presentation, the patient is tendered to direct palpation anteriorly and will either be unable to straight leg raise or will have a significant extensor lag present. The examining physician needs to perform a careful vascular exam and assess the patient's lower leg compartments as an injury to the recurrent anterior tibial artery may be present which can lead to compartment syndrome. The diagnosis of a tibial tubercle avulsion fracture can often be made solely on plain radiographs, with a displaced tibial tubercle evident on the lateral view. If concerns for intraarticular extension exist, a CT scan may be obtained for improved characterization of the injury and preoperative planning. Tibial tubercle avulsion fractures are classified according to the Watson-Jones classification. Type 1 fractures are the most common and are separated into type 1A, which show an incomplete separation of the fragment from the metaphysis, and type 1B, which show a complete separation. With type 1B fractures, the avulsed fragment of the tuberosity is avulsed and displaced proximally. In type 2 fractures, the tubercle epiphysis is lifted anteriorly and proximally, separating the tubercle ossification center, as well as partially separating the non-articular portion of the proximal tibial epiphysis. Type 2A fractures are non-comminuted, and type 2B show comminution of the fracture fragments. With type 3 injuries, the fracture propagates from the tuberosity in a proximal and posterior direction so that it involves the articular portion of the proximal tibial epiphysis. Type 3A fractures are often seen as a single displaced fragment, and type 3B show evidence of comminution. With respect to management, type 1 fractures can typically be treated non-operatively in a cylinder cast with the knee in full extension for a period of 6 weeks. Non-operative treatment requires that the fracture fragment reduces with the knee in extension with less than 2 millimeters of displacement accepted. The reduction is evaluated on the lateral radiograph with the knee in full extension. Comparison of the position of the tubercle and that of the patella are made to radiographs of the contralateral knee. If greater than 2 millimeters of displacement remains with the knee in extension, then operative treatment is indicated. Displaced type 1B, type 2, and type 3 avulsion fractures require operative intervention with a variety of techniques and approaches reported. Type 3 fractures typically require an arthrotomy to confirm an anatomic articular reduction in addition to an assessment of the menisci which are commonly torn and associated with higher grade injuries. Fixation of the avulsed tubercle fragment can be achieved with pins or screws inserted perpendicular to the tubercle in the proximal tibial metaphysis. For our case presentation, the patient is a healthy active 17-year-old high school soccer player who during a soccer game collided with the goalie and felt a pop in the anterior aspect of his knee. Immediately following the injury, he had anterior knee pain and inability to bear weight. He was brought to the emergency room where x-rays showed evidence of a displaced tuber tibial tubercle avulsion fracture. He was placed into a knee immobilizer and admitted overnight for serial neurovascular checks. The following day, he was brought to the operating room for operative management of his type 3A tibial tubercle avulsion fracture. Anatomic landmarks including the outline of the patella, the joint line, and the outline of the displaced tibial tubercle were marked out. A midline incision was made and soft tissue dissection was performed down to the level of the fracture site. 
Flaps were elevated both medially and laterally, further exposing the displaced fracture fragment. The fragment was grasped with an Alice clamp, allowing for exposure of the underlying fracture bed. Fracture hematoma was removed from the site of injury, and the area was thoroughly irrigated. Utilizing a curette, the fracture bed and the undersurface of the tibial tubercle fracture fragment were debrided to healthy appearing bone. The tibial tubercle fragment was then reduced and provisionally fixed using two threaded guide pins. Anatomic reduction was confirmed using intraoperative fluoroscopy. Next, the proximal guide pin was removed and a small vertical incision was made in the patellar tendon, allowing for insertion of the drill guide. The first 4.5 mm cortical screw, which was 58 mm in length, was inserted in lag fashion. Approximately 15 mm distal to the first screw, a second 4.5 mm cortical screw, which was 60 mm in length, and a washer were similarly inserted in lag fashion. Fluoroscopy confirmed an anatomic reduction of the tibial tubercle fracture fragment and appropriate screw length. To provide additional distal fixation, number two high strength suture material was passed in crack out fashion through the distal 1.5 centimeters of the patellar tendon on its medial side and fixed to the tibial metaphysis using a suture anchor. This was repeated on the lateral side, similarly passing number two high strength suture through the distal 1.5 centimeters of the patellar tendon and fixed to the tibial metaphysis using a second suture anchor. The free suture ends were then passed through the most distal aspect of the torn patellar tendon, securing it to the underlying bone. The knee was taken through a gentle range of motion, confirming secure fixation of the tibial tubercle. The wound was then thoroughly irrigated and closed in layers, starting with the paratenon layer. The skin was closed with a running subcuticular monocro suture and the wound covered in surgical glue. Sterile dressings were then applied and the knee was placed into a hinge knee brace locked in extension. Postoperatively, the patient was kept non wayfaring with the knee locked in extension for four weeks. At the four week postoperative time point, he commenced formal physical therapy working on his knee range of motion. At two months postoperatively, he regained full range of motion and started working on his quadriceps strengthening. At the three-month postoperative time point, he was non-tender over his tibial tubercle, had 5 out of 5 quadriceps strength, and postoperative radiographs demonstrated a healed tibial tubercle. He was allowed back to training with a return to sport once his endurance had returned. There is little in the orthopedic literature regarding the outcomes following treatment of tibial tubercle avulsion fractures. Most studies are small, retrospective case series. The available data indicates that excellent results are typical with a high percentage return to athletics with minimal long-term sequelae. Potential complications that can occur with the management of tibial tubercle avulsion fractures include the development of compartment syndrome associated with the injury acutely, post-treatment recurvatum deformity, post-operative knee stiffness, hardware-related complaints including uh, painful screw heads and bursitis over the tubercle, and recurrent fracture. Thank you very much for your time and attention.